In 2010, she was the inaugural recipient of American University's Most Innovative Green Teacher of the Year Award. At Cadmus, Vicki has worked for the U.S. Green Building Council to develop and support the Leadership and Energy and Environmental Design Rating, also known as LEAD, advises the EPA's Energy Star Commercial and Industrial Branch, and manages sustainability initiatives for clients as diverse as the Smithsonian Institution and local governments. Sayu Bojwani is the founder and president of New American Leaders, the only national organization focused on preparing immigrant leaders to run for public office. She's also served as New York City's first commissioner on immigrant affairs. As an advocate, speaker, and writer, Sayu engages people in public debate and the democratic process. She has a PhD in politics and education from Columbia University, where her research focuses on immigrant po political participation. Sayu is currently a visiting scholar at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University and a Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow at the Council of Independent Colleges. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to see, is Mike is on and good? Great. I'm thrilled to see that the average age of the audience appears to be 30 or less, so this is exactly the demographic that <laughs> <laughs> we want to reach. Um, Sayu, your book is fascinating on a number of levels, and I, I will get to all of them during this conversation, but certainly uh, there's the element of the fascination of the people that you write about who are people that you have advised, I think, in, uh, as a result of your organization, New American Leaders. Um, and then there's this very interesting look at the infrastructure of electoral politics, where you really describe in detail what you have to do and what it takes to run and how these folks have done what they've done. Um, and then there's the aspect of your recommendations about how we make this change and what needs to change. But I think we agreed before we came out here that we'd start with the elections <laughs> as this hinge point and this a uh, question of um, sort of immigrant rhetoric and Trump and then the people that are kind of, you know, running and despite all of this and your work, which I understand is you undertook in 2010, so you predate this and mm -hmm. sort of come to it with uh, a lot of uh, years before pre-Trumpian years. And then Ilan Omar, who is our newest Somali American congresswoman from Minnesota is in your book. Um, I mean, how 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 did this happen? I mean, <laughs> Trump, Ilhan Omar, <laughs> yeah, our democracy, broken Expl democracy. Explain yeah. this to me. Um, okay, well, I don't know if I can explain it all, but I can try. Um, so first of all, thank you all for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, everywhere I go, the first row is always empty. I'm not sure why, but um, we need to change that. You know, we have to be at the front row of democracy uh, in order to make change. So I'll start by saying that I, I started New American Leaders in 2010 because I was concerned about the um, large number of anti-immigrant bills that were coming through the state legislatures. So in fact, although it was 2016 when Trump got elected, I think the mood um, in some states has been anti-immigrant for a long time. And communities have been facing xenophobia and racism um, and Islamophobia for quite some time. Uh, and one might argue from the beginning of uh, the founding of America. So when I started the organization, the goal was to try to get more voices like mine into government, and that was informed by my own experience. As you heard, I had been Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs, and so I knew what it took, uh, what it meant to have a voice like mine at the table, and it was really that experience that led me to start the organization. Uh, I think what happened after Trump got elected is that many, many more people who either were not aware of what was going on in their communities or in other communities in terms of this kind of anti-immigrant climate and action, um, or were, had a faith in our democracy um, that I think was broken after the 2016 election. So this kind of combination of awareness of um, 
I don't want to say latent racism because it wasn't always latent. It's sometimes quite uh, um, blatant. Uh, but for some people, there was an a lack of awareness of that, and then there was a lack of understanding of how dysfunctional our democracy is and has been. Uh, and I think that created the environment that I'm attempting to answer your your large question. I think that created the environment that you know that we see today, where there were large, um, there was a large voter turnout, you know, unprecedented really uh, in terms of midterms. Uh, that there were these amazing candidates who not only were supported but also took it upon themselves to run after the the Trump administration started to put out these policies and these messages that were so virulently um, xenophobic and racist. And, and I think that had it not been for that, I think many people, many immigrants, uh, people of color, women would have continued to be on the sidelines. Um, but I think we felt like we had to step up and be the advocates our communities needed. And then it was, our elections or their elections were supported by this incredible engagement that we're seeing from the American people. Yeah, one of the things you, you mention in the book, you, you have the statistic that I think is, for most people, would be quite surprising, which is that uh, by 2040, a third of America will be either an immigrant or sons or daughters of immigrants. Right. Well, that's if, uh, you know, Assuming that yeah. we uh, don't strip people of their citizenship, and um, you know the numbers of immigrants are, are definitely, uh, as the the numbers of immigrants coming to our shores will likely decrease if certain policies are in place. But yes, assuming that we continue at the rate that we are growing. Um, so the health of our democracy is really bound up with very in intently, I, I would imagine, with. The, your mission, I mean, this, this outreach and, and this, this question of who these folks are, I think is also interesting and what their, their common characteristics are or you know, the backgrounds that, that cause you to be interested in them. You've identified a number of these folks. Uh, certainly the people you write about, what are those characteristics that you see and that you, what causes you to reach down and say, come with me, let me, teach you a few things and? Uh, so we, so in terms of the organization, we work in partnership with local organizations, uh, state-based organizations that have uh, immigrant member base or a refugee member base. So often those folks are organizers, um, they're community organizers and advocates and that's the pool from which they're recruiting for our training. I think that in, in the book, the stories, I chose these stories because each of these people both had a particular, particularly uh, interesting story to tell, but also their elections tied to something within our political system. So, you know, I have a chapter in this book that's about public financing and how two women ran for state house in Arizona in 2016 and are now reelected. And they were able to run and win because they didn't have to raise a lot of money because the Arizona Clean Elections Program gave them a certain amount of money so that their focus could be on engaging voters and getting their message out and they didn't have to worry about running for office. I'm sorry, of raising money. Uh, and so I wanted to tell the stories of these two women, but I wanted to tell it in the context of public financing. Um, similarly, I tell the story of a couple of uh, women who got elected to their city councils because those city councils in Yakima and Detroit went from being what are called at-large councils, meaning that if you're voting, I actually don't remember what you have in, in DC, but if you're voting, uh, when, you're, when you go to vote, you're voting for someone who actually is just gonna represent a portion of the city on the council versus voting for someone who's gonna be uh, representing the entire city. So you could be living in a part of, uh, of Washington, D.C. Uh, that will never see a resident of your district be elected to the council if it's an at-large council. Um, so if you can imagine, in, the, in this book I tell um, also about a, 
a, store, a person who got elected through a shift from at large to what we call single member districts. And in his case, it's in Anaheim, which is the city that, um, that is the home to Disneyland. And when he got elected after the shift from at large to single member, he was the first person ever elected from his neighborhood because in the past it was the wealthier sections of Anaheim that were were able to elect folks. So I don't want to get too technical, um, and I hope the book is not too technical. But it really want the the goal of these store of identifying who whose stories I would tell um, was very much to tell the stories of uh, political obstacles and how they prevent people like us from getting elected. Um, and then one last point I'll make about the folks that we train, you know, what we're looking for are three things. We're looking for how connected are they to immigrant communities? Do you, because as we know, someone who happens to be an immigrant or a child of immigrant is not necessarily always connected to their community. We're also looking for self-awareness um, and we're looking for uh, movement experience. So what kind of movements have they been involved in civil rights movements, immigrant rights movements, reproductive justice, because the goal, um, and, and, and this is the case with these folks in the book and, and some of the inspiring elected officials that we're all excited about having in Congress, these are people who deeply understand the issues that their communities are facing and are ready and willing to fight on behalf of those issues. So that's, those are the criteria that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's interesting, you mentioned the structural barrier of not having a sort of single member district representation. Um, I mean, how common is that nationwide? That, that I mean, that there aren't single member uh, district representation or that there isn't this representation? Is this, I mean, is I this think a common structural it problem? It is fairly common, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's, it becomes, it comes to the surface when uh, the demographics of a city have changed considerably. And I, I'm i talking primarily about the racial and ethnic composition of the district, but also the class composition of the district. Right. Because in the case of Anaheim, for example, there had been Latinos on the city council. They just weren't residents of the poorer sections of Anaheim. In the case of Yakima, which is a city in Washington state, uh, there had never been any Latinos on the city council, even though the city is over 40% Latino. So you really, um, what has happened uh, is that in a number of, part, number of parts of the country, the uh, ACLU has been involved in lawsuits um, around this because it's, it's often a violation of the Voting Rights Act. And then in, um, in, in Orange County, California, where because of the lawsuit um, against the city of Anaheim, there have a number of the districts, a number of the cities there have gone to uh, single member districts in order to avoid the lawsuit. Um, so I think it's a question of, it, it's common, but it's also maybe not um, a barrier until the city's demographics start to change significantly. Right. So this is something that we should be aware of and maybe yeah. work to change. Certainly. And also, by the way, it happens with school, it's school boards as well. Mm. So, you know, you can have a predominantly white school board uh, member, a school board of directors um, and schools that have largely students of color. And so these school boards make decisions about how funding is allocated, how assessment is conducted, who the superintendent is. And, and so it's not really just about um, representation, but it's also about mm. what is the kind of, uh, how do we create opportunities for equitable education for our students of color? So let's uh, talk uh, about a couple of these stories. I mean, there's not only the structural barriers, but all of these personal barriers, everything from money to, oh God, I don't know, you know, single parent, uh, you know, status to, um, of course, all of the barriers that would come with just experiencing casual racism right. uh, and discrimination. I mean, what are some of the, I, I mean, pick a couple people and tell us, you know, yeah, sure. about So them. I'll stick with the uh, Anaheim example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the story I tell about Anaheim um, it centers around Jose Moreno, who is now a city council member in Anaheim, but moved to the United States at the age of four, um, his family 
told him that he was going to come to Disneyland, um, but in fact, they were really migrating. And uh, it turns out he didn't go to Disneyland until he was much older. But, um, but Jose sort of embedded himself in the Anaheim community um, and uh, was, was undocumented until he uh, got to high school, at which point uh, many uh, immigrants actually benefited from a law signed by Reagan providing a pathway to citizenship. And so once he became a citizen, he went on to college and to uh, get a graduate degree and then came back and raised a family in Anaheim. And I tell his story um, to you all and in this book because I, uh, there's, it's, a, it's very much a David and Goliath story. So he ran in 2014 and lost because Anaheim was still at large, uh, was still at large. But in that election, there was a ballot measure that voters could uh, could vote for that helped set up the, the, the council to go from at large to single member district. So he ran again in, in 2016. And in 2016, he was running against someone who was already on the council. Um, but Anaheim is a fascinating place because Disneyland is present there. And so many of us go to Disney to Anaheim as tourists and to Disneyland as tourists. But it has, uh, but obviously that economy um, and that industry is being supported by uh, a large number of service work, you know, service workers um, or workers in the service industry. And so there is this real tension between the residents of Anaheim and Disney Corporation. And in 2016, Disney spent about $900,000. About $900,000 was traced to the Disney Corporation, um, which supported an, a number of political action committees and C4s that in different ways uh, were working to ensure that Jose Moreno didn't get elected to office because he is a real champion of uh, Anaheim residents and particularly of the working class. This year, he got reelected. Um, Disney spent over a million dollars uh, mm -hmm. in that election, not just against him, but against other uh, candidates um, and against a, a measure, ballot measure that is uh, going to get a minimum wage increase in the city. So, um, and and Jose in his first election raised about forty thousand dollars, and in this election raised about seventy thousand dollars. So, what I think is remarkable about his story is here's someone who was formerly undocumented, who was really embedded in the community, who didn't have to raise a lot of money to win the first time. The first time he won by about 72 votes, and um, this year, it's not about 72 votes, by 72 votes, and then this year about by about 1,000 votes. So, um, you know, I think you, I give that example because we saw a lot of that this year, right? We saw candidates outspent uh, by incumbents or by establishment candidates who still won because they touched something in all of us. They really worked to bring the types of voters to the polls who don't often get approached by party leaders or by incumbents. Uh, so that's Jose's story. And then um, someone else who has won uh, a re-election campaign this year. So everybody that um, whom I tell talk about in the book won in either 2015 or 2016. So this year, some of them were running re-election campaigns. Um, and one of them, again, going back to Arizona, is Athena Salman, who is uh, fairly, I think she's in her early 30s. Don't quote me on that. I should know this because I wrote about her. But she was a student organizer and a union organizer mm -hmm. before she ran for office. And she very passionately believes in Arizona's clean elections program. So when she got elected in 2016, she wanted to be on the state legislative committee that helped to uh, decide and continue to ensure that that clean e elections program um, stays in place because it's always under threat. Every election cycle, it's under threat. And increasingly what's happening in Arizona is that because of um, Citizens United uh, and because of the amount of money that is spent through political action committees and independent expenditures, it's hard, like if I'm gonna run for state ledge and I wanna be part of the clean elections campaign, there's a cap, right? There's only gonna be, I, I don't wanna give you the exact figure because it changes every election cycle, but let's say it's $25,000. 
that the state is going to give me. That's all that I will have to spend. And uh, you know, let's say there's uh, the equivalent of Disney that wants to come in and spend a lot of money against me. I am capped out of this twenty-five thousand. And so the program is under threat, but also fewer and fewer candidates want to use it because they want to be competitive and they want to raise as much money as possible. And so anyway, Athena not only is on that committee, but she has been extremely active in her first two years as a legislator. Uh, she has been uh, instrumental in making sure that the educators in Arizona got access to the state capitol um, when you know there were all those protests around. Arizona is, I believe, 48th or 49th in terms of education spending per pupil. So they're actually um, severely underfunding their schools and therefore underpaying teachers. Um, so our, uh, Athena was very active in that. And she was also very active in um, a program that ensured that uh, female prisoners were able to access sanitary napkins. Um, I believe it's an unlimited amount now, and there was like a ration to how much they could mm -hmm. get, which is a complete violation of their dignity, frankly. Um, and now she's the minority whip in the Arizona State Legislature. So I tell her story because, um, Ari because Athena, uh, her interest in running for office was really sparked after her student and union activism. And that trajectory to, to um, you know, she's very well positioned now to run for higher office. And it's something that we, you know, we see with, with Ilhan Omar, who just got elected to Congress, who is also in my book. And I tell the story of how she got elected to the state leg legislature in Minnesota. She defeated a 44-year incumbent. So the person whom she defeated uh, had been in office before Ilhan was born. Um, and that was a very contentious race in Minnesota in 2016. But then, after, because she had served in the state legislature for two years, she was able to run for Congress this year when Keith Ellison decided not to run. Um, and there are other women who, like Rashida Tlaib, who just got elected to Congress, and Ayanna Presley, who got elected to Congress from Massachusetts. All of these women had served in local and state office. and. You know, this has been a year, an incredible year, for people who have never run for office before um, are winning congressional seats, like Lauren Underwood in Illinois. But in general, you know, the majority of people who are in Congress have held local or state office before. So the fact that these, uh, the people in my book have started at the local and state level and are building a profile, and it's not that they would necessarily go on to run for Congress, but that they do have a very strong uh, platform of things that they're doing right now for voters and constituents, and they're well positioned for higher office. So that you know, um, we were talking about the New Yorker cover earlier. I don't know how many of you've seen this. It's a great cover of uh, the number of women that are coming in um, into Congress now to change the composition of that legislative body. You know, it's still only a handful, right? So if we really want to see that change, we need a lot more people to be supported, recruited and supported, and then to be well, um, you know, it takes practice to be a good legislator. So they really need to get their chops at the local and state level. Not to mention that that's where most people are looking to for their everyday issues, right? It's a critical place for where policy is decided. Mm, that's true. You know, you, you mentioned that uh, they touched, these, these candidates touch something in people. How do they deal with this question of, that comes up of you know how can you represent a, a varied community? I mean, people that don't look, the people that aren't like you, that aren't immigrants. Yeah, so I mean, a couple of things about that. First of all, none of the women who you've been hearing a lot about, or really no one wins an election by targeting only one ethnic community, right? Like, you know, that, that the way to win a campaign is the way to win an election is to build a winning coalition of all the voters in your district, uh, you know, multiple groups of voters in your district. Um, and I think there is a danger often when we think about uh, a reflective democracy, you know, a democracy that uh, looks like us, to um, make that be about identity politics. And the fact of the matter is that you really just can't run and win an election on the basis of your ethnic identity. I mean, it's not something that is a successful strategy. Um, at the same time, I do want to say that there is, there's no question that not only are they getting those kinds of questions, but that they are, um, that 
immigrants and people of color are constantly being asked to justify our qualifications and our credibility to run for office. So we have an alumna in uh, Arizona who just won her state house seat, uh, Raquel Teran. She um, was served papers last week by someone who is accusing her of not being a citizen. This is the second time this has happened because she ran and won. I'm sorry, she ran in 2012, uh, lost that election, but uh, her citizenship was challenged then, and it's being challenged again. And so there's a kind of psychological warfare that we have to experience as people of color about uh, about our right to be here. Um, and so even after she's won the election, she has to spend time and energy away from her constituents to deal with this accusation. Uh, and you know that journey is, I think, going to take a long time. It's going to take a really long time when uh, for us to get away from seeing people like Ilhan and Rashida um, not just as exceptions, but as the norm. And so while we celebrate their successes and we celebrate the fact that they are first, um, and in fact, actually, one of the nice things about this year is that it's not just one Muslim woman who's been elected, but two American Muslim women, not just one Native woman. And you know, it's crazy that we, we this is the first time that we're going to have a Native woman in Congress. But but also that she's not alone; that she'll have another person like her. And I I think that there's no question that there's power in numbers, and one uh, two is definitely better than one, but ten and twenty is definitely better than two. What what will happen as they ascend in their careers? I mean, where will they draw? Will they rely on each other? Uh, will it? Will our cultural suppositions change? I mean, how will this happen, and how soon will it happen, or will it happen? Well, I think they're already relying on each other. You know, some of them won their primaries earlier in the year, and I think they've definitely built uh, a sense of um, solidarity with each other. Uh, I think that. You know, the challenge where I thought you were going to go with that question is where where are they going to go in this system, right? They're yeah. walking into um, a yeah. system that is um, that is kind of toxic, actually. Yeah. I mean, that you sort of, people have moved away from remembering that they were elected to represent constituents to thinking that they need to consolidate their own power base, whether that's, you know, getting to be the head of a committee or um, the vice chair of a committee, uh, all these kinds of machinations that are going on in, in all our legislatures, but in, in, um, in a kind of magnified way in Congress. I think that for the newcomers, there is gonna be uh, some negotiation, right, around like where, how much are they going to need to be part of the system at the time that we're trying to build a system that works differently. And that that's always hard, right? It's like renovating your house while you're living in it. There are definitely challenges. Um, I, I do think that they recognize, since many of them, by the way, I mean, uh, one of the things that I've been struck by is how much the Democrats have claimed these victories when many of these women ran in spite of the Democratic Party. Um, they did not necessarily get their support. Um, Rashida ran uh, on a, she ran to succeed John Conyers. There were three Conyers on that ticket. Um, she was definitely not the can the expected candidate to win. Ayanna Presley ran against an incumbent. Um, although she herself is African American, the Congressional Black Caucus endorsed her opponent, who's a white male. Um, there was a sense that, she, you know, that she couldn't and shouldn't challenge the incumbent. So when you hear these, when you read these headlines about you know how the Democrats won the House and diversity wins, it's not diversity that won. It's uh, you know dedication and hard work on the part of these women who believed that they uh, understood something about their districts that the party establishment didn't. Um, and so I think now in Congress they're going to figure that out. You know how much are they going to be willing. How much do they need to play by the rules? How much do they want to play by the rules? And how much do they want to be spending energy changing the rules? But ultimately, you know, I think you said, you know, our when we think about who an American leader is, it should be like everybody in this room, not just um, white males. Um, and also when we think about who can run 
and represent any district of America, it should also look like the people in this room. So ultimately, that's where we need to get to in terms of the, your question about the cultural supp suppositions. In the meanwhile, I think we are all in this place of trying to figure out which of the rules do we play by in order to have the system at least function, um, and which of the rules can we change immediately, which you know are sort of second tier changes. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I, to go back to Ilan Omar, I mean, she is from the Democrat Farmer Labor Party. Yeah. I mean, is this a, um, you know, I, I'm not uh, clued in really to regional politics, but is this, it's, it's, it's still Democrats and Republicans. Yes. It's still very much a two-party system there. Very much, very much. And I, I think, you know, look, I mean, there's a lot of talk about third party. It takes a yeah. while for a third party to have, um, and I'm not advocating for or against it. I just think that there is a structure, um, and the question of even if there is going to be a third party system, right now there's a two party system, right? So we're going to have to figure out like, is right. it, it? It is possible, I suppose. Maybe I don't know what you guys think, but it feels like it's possible to imagine a working third party in the United States in a way that I think wasn't possible to imagine even two years ago. But getting there um, is going to take a while. And so I think we want to be careful about not, in my opinion, I think we want to be really careful about not um, losing the momentum and the power and the energy that we have built uh, in all these states around the country through these candidates and through grassroots efforts by, um, I mean, I think it, I think we are in a good position to challenge the Democratic Party to be better and work better for the rest of the country. Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of my pragmatic approach right now. Um, but in a kind of grander vision, I think it would be great to have a third party. Increasingly number, increasing number of people identify as independents. I think an increasing number of people feel disillusioned by both parties. Mm -hmm. And so there's certainly room for that. But at the national level, it's hard to imagine, like, for example, an independent candidate winning a 2020 president, presidential race. Do you work with the Democratic Party in New American Leaders? No, we don't. We are a nonpartisan organization, um, and the majority of... Uh, you know, we ask for party identification just for tracking, mm -hmm. but uh, the reality is that the reason that the majority of our applicants tend to be Democrat is predominantly because of the way that the Republicans deal with immigration. So that once that, um, as long as that remains on the table as uh, this polarizing issue, um, it's very hard to imagine that that our organization will be able to attract any Republicans. Because I said earlier that a core element of how we select people to the program is their support and embrace of their immigrant heritage. Uh, and it's hard to run on the Republican Party platform by owning your immigrant experience just because of the toxic way that the Republicans are dealing with immigration. You haven't. Um I mean, because we're in Washington, D.C., we're on the border of the South. I'm going to, um, uh, you have a candidate um, that uh, has been successful in Gwinnett County, Georgia. Yeah. Sam Park, who is a very unusual Georgian. I guess um, he's a gay man, a Baptist, Korean American, I don't know, son of immigrants. Yeah, son of immigrants. I mean, really, I mean, how, uh, you know, but yet he is, and, I don't know what little I know about suburban Atlanta. I mean, he's obviously representing, a, you know, a district that is doesn't look like him. Doesn't really. Well, I mean, know. he's representing a district that changed quite dramatically in the last decade mm -hmm. or so, and because he lived in that district, uh, he was able to see those demographic changes, right? So it, it is actually a very diverse dis district that includes Asian Americans, Latinos, and African Americans. And it's a district that really had not been on the radar of the Democratic Party. And so when he ran, he ran against a moderate Republican woman in 2016 um, and won by 800 votes. Uh, and then she ran against him this year 
and he won that election um, by more votes, but I can't tell you the number because there's a lot of numbers in my head and I want to give you the wrong number, but more than 800. Um, and I think, like, you know, there are lots of Asian Americans in that district. This is Gwinnett County. Um, but I think people, I mean, just as we're seeing in the, in the Georgia governor's race that no, when, when candidates like Sam and Stacey Abrams run, they have a real sense of what's going on in their communities and mm -hmm. who the voters are um, or who the voters could be. So I talked earlier about Athena. Athena and Isela ran in Arizona and they increased their uh, voter turnout by 23% in their district, predominantly by reaching people who are not usually talked to by candidates and parties, right? It's the same thing that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did in her district. She was able to win that race because she went and talked to voters who had never heard from the incumbent Congress member. And, and so... And is this door knocking primarily? Yeah, this is door knocking. Yeah. This is door knocking, um, particularly for local and state races. And so, you, you know, there are two things. One is that the candidate doesn't necessarily have to look like you, but the candidate has to be somebody who you feel who you trust mm -hmm. to fight for you in Washington or in Albany or you guys don't have a state capital, but you know, in, um, in the state capital or at the city council, I think the thing that people want, and I think what we saw this year in the, si in the election cycle is that these candidates won not because they were endorsed by parties, not because they were able to raise millions of dollars, but because voters wanted somebody who they felt was not the norm and who was going to fight for them, right? So I'll give you an example also of Georgia um, because I'm really fascinated by this. Some of you may remember that last year um, there was a big congressional race in Georgia 6th for um, where we were. We saw a lot of money go to John Ossoff, right? Because the idea was that that, could be the, that would be the first Democratic win after the Trump election. Uh, $30 million dollars went to that race. He raised $30 million. Um, and a uh, Republican woman won that race. And then this year, she was challenged by Lucy McBath, um, who is a mother of the movement who had lost her son to gun violence. Lucy raised a little over a million dollars and won that race. Karen, the opponent, the Republican opponent, raised $8 million. So I tell you this because I think it mattered, it's not so much that we couldn't have, we as progressives or the Democratic Party couldn't have won that race. It's that they didn't have, we did not have a candidate in that race who could win that district. And so it's only a year and a half later, conditions are roughly the same. Trump was president then, Trump is president now. And this woman who is an African American woman who lost her son to gun violence was able to win this race at a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the amount that it cost John Ossoff to lose that race, you know? And so I think what re what the, st to me, the lesson here is that it has to be the right candidate. And you have to be employing the right strategy, which is talking to people who never hear from incumbents. Um, and it's giving people a sense that you are gonna fight for everyday voters and not just for your own interests. It's time, that. yeah, it's time for questions, I think. Um, I mean, we s have yet to talk about kind of the uh, dynamics of what you do with, with these leaders in New American Leaders, but, you know, let's open the floor. Um. Thank you so much. <coughs> Sorry if it's a bit of a geeky question, but, uh, and uh, anecdotal, but I remember after the election, um, I've seen, I've seen some, um, initiatives from the from the from the tech sector to provide uh, resources to to candidates um, at, 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 the, at the local level uh, tech for campaigns for example has grown into leveraging talents at LinkedIn and other big Silicon Valley companies to provide that infrastructure and I wonder if that's just anecdotal or there was because the, the tech sector tend to be I mean until Peter, Peter Thiel perhaps but tend to be sort of removed from the the politics and um, Sometime you know, sort of go on, a, go on an island somewhere and, and kind of against um, politics. But uh, since Trump election, I've seen on the on the on the left the, this movement of talents to support candidates at the local level. And I wonder if that played a role or or, or not. Um, well, 
Well, I don't know if it if it played a role. What I will say is that there. I mean, I you know I was saying this earlier that I think that after the Trump election, there it it has been an all hands on deck to make democracy work better. And so where I mean tech, like with everything, you know, some of it was going to really have an effect. Some of it is just going to be a fly by night thing, and it's not clear to me yet where we're going to land on what worked really well and, and what didn't. But, you know, I um, I don't know if this, I also the other thing is I don't know what, I was doing some canvassing this year. Um, I think text texting from anywhere to voters is something that I hadn't seen at this scale before. Like we, I can sit here and um, contact voters for Stacey Abrams in Georgia, for example. Um, and so I think people were able to connect to campaigns from all around the country using certain tech tools. What I don't know is how whether those tech tools emerged after 2016 or were just being used more after 2016. Hey, thank you both um, for, for doing this. So I have two questions. Um, because I'm 34, my younger sister's 22. Um, my mother is like 65. And I'm always like, guys, you have to vote, you have to vote, you have to vote. So one, like, you said we have a long way to go before there's a third party. Um, what's, what, you know, in a very simplified, bulleted <laughs> list, what steps do we need to take to get to that reality? Um, and secondly, will that change? Basically, people who are disgusted with both parties not voting, just simply not voting. Um, and two, um, the fact that, you know, nationally, just because you've got millions more votes doesn't mean you win the presidency. Um, and if what you might want to, <laughs> anything you want to say about that. Well, so I'll, the thing I will say is that I think that a third party is not going to necessarily make voting easier. I mean, we don't want people to vote in this country, right? That there is a reason, there's an incentive to prevent people from voting because if I've won the election over and over and over, why would I want new people to come enter the, the equation, right? So I, I think the thing, the heart of what you're talking about is how do we make it easier to vote and how do we make it easy, for me, the heart of what you're talking about is how do we make it easy for people to vote and how do we make it so that they feel inspired to vote? Um, and some of that I think we will see with these candidates who are running and winning, right? I think that people are motivated to vote if they feel connected to the process and we don't give them much to be connected to. Like our leaders don't look like the rest of America. They're wealthy white, well connect, wealthy white males, um, which is not how most of America is. Um, you may be wealthy but not white. You may be white but not wealthy. Um, you're definitely not, we're definitely not all males. Um, so as the electorate and as America becomes browner and younger and more diverse, if we're not able to prevent, present alternatives, uh, alternative narratives of leadership alternative narratives of what needs to happen in our country, then I don't think we're going to motivate people to vote. And I'm not sure that a third party can be the answer to that. I think we just need to create the reforms that allow more people to participate. You know, making election day a holiday. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do that are not so dramatic and that won't take forever. I um. I also thank you for uh, the really hard work of putting together a book. Um, and um, my question is is two pronged, I guess. The first is if you know we are increasingly younger, browner, more diverse as residents and as an electorate, but I also feel like we are increasingly mobile. And uh, how does that impact? Candidates' abilities to know their um, to know their districts. If we are so highly mobile with turnover rates uh, in, in different jobs or university students or wh whatever the case may be, um, and gig economy workers included, right. so I'm kind of looking at a, an almost borderless, very fluid electorate and, and candidates, and I'm wondering if that's been coming up in any of your research or realities with who's running and who's representing where. And um, and then my second question is the, the power of positive 
uh, campaigning rather than negative campaigning. It still seems to me like everything's super, super polarized, um, even with the advent of you know wonderful things that can go viral with uh, within social media. Um, there still seems to me a lot of emphasis on negative TV ads and, and radio ads and somehow that resonates and fires people up in, in different ways. So I'm wondering if there is power in positivity because I would, I would, I mean, I personally believe that on a personal level, but um, what's really motivating people to vote? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I was, I was sort, I sort of had an answer, but then you ended with what's motivating people to vote, and that's a big question. That's like 16 questions, but um, I will say that, you know, I was talking to somebody about this earlier, that I'd spent time in Arizona and Georgia during the election cycle, and people are being bombarded with ads, and in Arizona, they were particularly uh, negative, I thought, um, and you know, some of that is not coming from the campaign. Some of that is coming from these political action committees and independent expenditures. So it's a little difficult because even if the candidate, and they're not supposed to be coordinated, so, you know, if there's a group that's, say, anti-immigrant and they're putting out messages about the Latino candidate for governor, um, I, it's hard to kind of control that. Um, I think the people who, the stories that you all are familiar with, you're familiar with them because they're inspiring, right? Like the, the, uh, you know, the names we hear over and over right now are Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Deb Haaland and what's not associated with those campaigns are these negative ads. So I do think there's a power in positivity. I just think there are a lot of players right now um, and you can't always regulate what people are doing. Um, in terms of the mobility of voters, I mean, this has been an ongoing, you probably, ongoing issue for college students, right? Like there is, and that's why I'm saying, like I think there's gotta be, we're a smart country, like we ought to be able to figure out how to make it easier for you to vote wherever you are, from your phone, for heaven's sake, right? Um, if we have the technology to be, for my credit card to come up every time I wanna order something from the gap, like why can't I vote from my phone? Like why can't we regulate that? Now, after the 2016 election, there's been a lot of pushback against, uh, uh, you know, like sort of a pro-paper ballot uh, movement, if you will. Um, and I understand, you know, that there are pros and cons to both of these things. But I think we do need to figure this out so that the cost of voting is not so high. I had to do early uh, voting in New York. Um, well, really, I had to do absentee voting. So because we don't have early voting in New York. So you can only vote on that one day, and if you're not um, gonna be there, then you have to either request a ballot, and then of course there's a cutoff date, or you have to go to your local office. And in my case, you know, I'm a white collar professional. I just walked from my apartment to the elections office. I had to spend about 30 minutes there, but I could do that and I cared enough to do that, and I was invested enough in the process. Um, but you know, most people, I mean, we live in a little bit of a bubble, like you guys have come out on a Tuesday night to hear me talk about politics. That's not what most people are interested in doing, and so I think there's, so I think one is like, how do we make it easier despite the mobility? But the other thing is, at the end of the day, you know, we want our, we want like issues to be addressed that affect us on a daily basis. So I do think that local piece, I mean, I think people are still local. It's a question of like, are they moving houses or are they going off to college, et cetera? That's the part that we have to fix. I don't know if, um, I think we still need local and state candidates who understand what's going on in their geographically specific community. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, thank you. The the gig economy workers uh, who um, tend to be all over yeah. uh, the place. And Washington D.C. is a perfect example of that because you know this is a very transit transitory town um, because of the politics and and so forth. So you know people are always voting. I voted absentee for Colorado right. or vote by mail. But I, I do work in the gig economy. I know there are a lot of people like me who tend to 
bounce around and we don't know what to call home. Yeah. But we, <laughs> we're registered to vote in one place or another. So I, I see this increasing um, and just wondering how, how organizations like New American Leadership is, it, it is or is, it is recognizing that. I mean, honestly, it's not, I, it's not something that we're specifically working on. Um, and I think that if you're, because we talk to candidates a lot, like one of the things we talk about is that you have to be rooted in your geographic community in order to be recognized and know what the issues are. Um, but I will say that like what you're describing is something that we hear about all the time, right? People don't know, they, they move, they forget like that they're, or they miss the deadline. And so if we could standardize things, that would help. Maybe there's methodology around standardizing the voting process across the country so that you're not tied to the rules of one place or another. I wonder if as you age, you'll settle down and you'll feel yourself rooted in a particular locality. I don't know how much of this is gen a generational thing or is it you know, a demographic trend. It's, it's a very interesting question of, you know, because you're talking about, you know, well, what if you don't as a voter feel a local identity? Because, you know, you're either, your work is everywhere or you're living indeed everywhere. And I don't know that, again, I think the answer is, yeah, as you say, probably structural that you could do things to make it easier for people to register and to vote in other places, but it's. Well, also if you're being affected by local policy in two or three different places, right? Um, that's a, a different challenge as yes. well. <laughs> and then I think it can lead to people feeling disconnected and not participating at all. That's I mean, bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, maybe there's that, yeah, I think, like, it, it's hard to say what that's going to look like in 10 or 12 years, actually. But I, I, to this point of, like, if people don't have an incentive, like, in your case, you want to participate, right? But if you're someone who's, um, you know, your focus is making a living and you're not that familiar with the process and you're not so concerned about whether you made the voter registration deadline in Arizona after you moved from California or in Georgia after you moved from Texas. You know, I think that is a very legitimate, um, I don't know if it's a trend. I guess that's what I'm saying. Like I, I, I can't quite tell if that's a trend or that's just, uh, there are certain groups of voters that tend to be more transient, college students being one. Um, and uh, so I, just, I can't quite tell what, how much of that is related to the gig economy or not. Okay, hi. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't really decided how I'm gonna phrase this just yet, but my question is, I completely understand this whole thing about like this blue wave is really taking credit for a lot of things that you have called the brown wave mm -hmm. about people and I just kind of wanted to know a little bit about the role of the media. And have you seen since Trump, especially with now these like new media outlets like Crooked Media and all these other like alternative sources, have they been reaching out to you? And is that going to actually deter these local candidates from actually winning? Because if, for example, like the reason why I know of all these candidates you're talking about is because I physically have met them and I follow them on right. Twitter and I know all these people because there's no reason for me to know anybody in Georgia, to be honest, yeah. or in Atlanta or in any of these places. Um, but I physically know them. Do you think that nationalizing politics and local elections is going to nationalize expectations and actually make it harder for them to win? And is it actually better that they are not getting the fee, like, for example, like Beto? Like, do you think if he wasn't on Ellen and if he wasn't, he might have won? Though, on the reverse, him being on Ellen might have helped other people in Texas win. So it's kind of one of those things. Like, how yeah. do, you, what do you, what do you think the role of the media is and what are kind of your observations? Um, okay, good. I'm, I'm glad you ended at that because that, that I can answer. What are my observations? Well, first of all, okay, so we, you know, we all want a savior, right? And... Um, I think there was a there's a lot of that that happens with like you know we we put people somebody wins a race we put them up on a pedestal somebody um, I want to be careful because you know Beto is great and I want to say anything but like the fact is that like he 
I think what you're asking about is whether someone who has national appeal also has local appeal, right? And, um, and I think that really varies. I think it's a question of who the person is and are they spending enough time. I think what happened with the congressional, um, the winners in their congressional primaries is that people weren't paying attention to them until they won and then they became these national figures. Whereas in Beto's case, it was like he hadn't won, but he had this national figure but uh, had this national reputation. Um, so I do think you need to have local roots and I think you have to appeal to your local base. I think that Beto, that Beto race, there are so many things that are going on there. Um, but I do, one of the things that, um, that I remember noticing and um, I turned out that I was sort of half wrong on this, like a number of Obama alumni went back to their home places and ran, and I wasn't sure where that was gonna land because they hadn't been home for a long time. Um, and I think it's sort of, I don't know what the breakdown was, but some of them did win. And But I think the ones who won really put a lot of time in the district and maybe had deeper roots than the ones who didn't, I'm not sure. I actually haven't uh, analyzed that. I'm conscious that this is being live streamed, so I, I wanna be, um, attacked for that because I don't actually know. But I think there are a couple things that I will wrap up with. One is I do think you you cannot win an election based on an, you can't win a, an election in your state based on a national reputation, um, for sure. The role of the media I think is particularly played out when we take, up, take people and we just put them on this pedestal and we swoop in on them. Um, you know, I got a lot of like, well, we're looking for the next Alexandria, you know? And you're like, okay, well, I mean, that's just not how it works, you know? And so I, I think there is, but on the upside of that, I would say that I think people do want positive stories. And so I think part, usually the media is looking for like the tension, but when these great wins happen, I, I think they do recognize that it's inspiring and, um, and it's a good story. So in that sense, it kind of, the media goes both ways on that, you know, that they, they want that tension, but they're also, quick to celebrate uh, unusual victories. Other questions? No? Uh, no. <laughs> you get the last yeah. word, okay. excellent. Give you 10 more. <laughs> so I'm thinking about money now because it's funny, your question resonates with me because I donated to all these people who are not running in my state and only because I'm aware of them because they've gotten national attention. Um, and not that I have millions to donate. Um, <laughs> but yes, so when you say, I just wanna understand where it all goes, other than TV ads or whatever ads are being paid for. Like I, I, I understand on a basic level what you were saying about how like a lot of the neg negative um, TV campaigns or whatever else that we see is not even the candidates like it's not even yeah. them. It's like from some other organization. So when when I when I read about this and hear about this, so and so raised a million dollars, or they or Disney spent X million amount of dollars against. What exactly does that mean? Like, is there a breakdown other than paying for TV commercials or paying for like where does all the, those millions of dollars go? Well, mailers. Okay. Um. So you know, you when I canvass, like often we knock on doors. There's like people have gotten multiple mailers, which sadly, many of them go in the garbage. Um, but mailers, you spend money on staff, we're gonna go out door to door knocking. Signs, yard signs, I don't know how much of that happens in DC, it doesn't happen in New York, but around the country there's yard signs. Um, I don't think that a lot of local and state candidates spend money on TV ads, you know? Um, I think that happens more at statewide or congressional levels. So it's hiring, you know, renting an office, so that your volunteers can come there, places where you can um, work on uh, on the campaign, things like that, food for volunteers, which is important. Um, is so, it then that people who spent less money but won had a higher number of volunteers? Yeah, absolutely. And they paid less to their campaign staff because they couldn't pay you know, higher amounts. I mean, I think they just had to run a strong campaign on fewer resources. And on positive or not Right, exactly, exactly. And I mean, 
it's never quite, I just did a quick search for like Lucy to see, you know, you don't always know because obviously like Lucy was supported by Emily's List and other candidates are supported by these organizations. So those candidates are, I mean, those organizations are also spending money. Sometimes they're sending you volunteers to work, um, to go out and, and knock on doors, that kind of thing. Okay, one last question. I'm actually very curious on a personal level why you picked this topic in particular to write about versus all of the other million things I know you're interested in? Like what, what brought you to highlight people's actual stories and what brought you to not talk about your experience as, as much? Because you um, do have a really great experience. <laughs> well, it's not as interesting as some of these people, but um, Karen and I used to work together, so she knows more than she should for this audience. <laughs> but um, so actually, that, thank you for asking that question. Though I wrote the book for two reasons. One is that I was meeting these people and hearing these stories, and I thought, people need to know what's going on. Because one of the things that we didn't even talk about is the role of money in deciding, in helping somebody decide whether they can even run in the first place. Um, because you know, state legislatures pay very little money. So, and in Arizona, uh, in Georgia, for example, I think the salary hasn't been adjusted for 20 years. People make $18,000 a year, $22,000 a year for jobs that are ostensibly part-time but are really full-time, right? Because um, when you want something done, you're not thinking, oh, state legislature is not session. You're like, I need to tell my state representative to deal with this problem. So, um, so I was hearing these stories. I was hearing how people were struggling to get endorsements, how even if they were, if they were gonna run against a Democrat, the party wasn't gonna support them. Um, and, and then alongside that, I was hearing their remarkable stories of resilience and determination. And so I originally started writing the book because I wanted to tell the stories. And then after the 2016 elections, when everybody was acting like democracy just broke, because Trump got elected, I was like, oh no, actually, it's been broken for a long time. It's been broken for people like us since a bunch of white guys sat down and created a government that was supposed to work for landowning males, you know? Um, and so the structure of the book came about after the 2016 elections. And that's when I started to like really break down into this single member district and incumbent advantage and things like that. Um, and use these stories to tell how people are navigating these obstacles and really running and winning despite the obstacles. Um, so that's why I wrote it. And, I, I, and it was easier to write than my own story, Kara. So that's why I, I started with this one. Love it. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Go to the next one. Maybe. Here we go. <laughs> Sayu, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your work. And thank you for the great questions. Thank you audience. all.